Hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to join the Usher Connections Conference and giving me a chance to describe the latest development in our quest to produce a non-human primate model of Usher 1B. I'm going to share my slides now. I just want to acknowledge a few of my many collaborators on this project, and especially uh, the support for this project by the Foundation Fighting Blindness and Save Sight Now. First of all, why do we need primate models for Usher syndrome in particular? I think most of you recognize that accurate animal models are critical for understanding the basis for different retinal diseases, and especially for preclinical testing of therapies in ways that will translate well to patients. It's only higher primates that have retinas that are nearly identical to ours with a fovea and a macula, like that shown here, that uh, underlie our high acuity vision and our full color vision. Um, and it is generally recognized that a lack of non-human primate models is a key barrier to the development of therapies. This is especially true for Usher syndrome because rodent models, which are used so commonly in, um, in medical research, don't provide accurate models of Usher. Most um, mo uh, rodent models of Usher syndrome do not show retinal degeneration. They show deafness and vestibular problems, but only very subtle changes um, in the retina that don't result in degeneration. And one of the reasons it's believed for this is very fundamental differences in the structure of photoreceptors between rodents and primates. I think most of you know that the photoreceptor cells are the major site of degeneration and Usher syndrome. They are also the, the critical cells where light is transmitted um, into the nervous system that's transformed into a neural signal that can be transmitted to the brain. Um, in primates, myO7a, the protein that is non-functional in Usher syndrome, is localized to a special part of the photoreceptors called the calicial processes that's shown here in orange. And these um, are very supportive for the outer segments of the photoreceptors the part of the cell that actually trans transforms light uh, into a neural signal. And also these structures uh, transfer uh, key molecules to the structure. Rodent retinas, retinas do not have this structure. And we think that's why they don't show the full spectrum of retinal disease in Usher syndrome. So <clears throat> we have pursued three different ways to create non-human primate models of retinal disease. One of them is searching for naturally occurring spontaneous models. And we have in fact done uh, retinal imaging to, to search for retinal disease in over a thousand monkeys. And we did a few years ago, find um, a naturally occurring model of Bardet beetle syndrome, which um, is a syndromic form of retinitis pigmentosa similar to Usher syndrome, but we have not uh, found any naturally occurring models uh, of Usher syndrome. We've also pursued genetic sequencing. We have a primate genetics group that um, is doing this intensively where we look for mutations in the genes that are involved in Usher syndrome and other retinal diseases. Again, we have not um, come up with uh, models that way. So we have, in the last few years, moved to gene editing, um, a much more complex, time-consuming, expensive approach, but so it, it's appropriate particularly for high-priority diseases. And when it first became possible to think about doing gene editing in non-human primates, we thought hard about what would be the highest priority disease to model. And there was a consensus that that would be Usher 1B because of its severity, its early onset, and its frequency as a cause of Usher syndrome and, and generally of 
retinitis pigmentosa. So this, uh, this effort involves uh, a lot of people, and in particular, um, John Hennebold and his group, he's the, uh, the chair of our Division of Reproductive Sciences, and he has been pursuing gene editing in macaque monkeys for some years now. And we also are um, so fortunate at our primate center to have experts in assisted reproductive technologies, such as in vitro fertilization. Uh, and we have a core group headed up by Carol Hanna. So putting these, these uh, wonderful um, kinds of expertise together makes it possible uh, to pursue this project. And the way this works is that we're using CRISPR editing. I think many of you may have heard of CRISPR, the molecular scissors that can be used to specifically cut out specific parts of certain genes. Um, and in this case, we are um, trying to remove key parts of the Myo7A gene in monkey embryos. So the way this works is that we do traditional in vitro fertilization methods where monkey females are given hormonal stimulation to produce multiple eggs. The eggs are collected, they're fertilized in vitro with monkey sperm, and several hours later, they are treated with CRISPR editing. So CRISPR agents are injected into the fertilized egg. And about a week later, um, if all goes well, that egg will have developed into a blastocyst, a young embryo. The um, surface of that embryo will be the cells that are going to develop into the placenta. And it's possible to use a laser biopsy to take a few of those cells without harming the rest of the embryo and use those cells for sequencing. In this way, we can identify which of the embryos have the desired editing of Myo7A. Meanwhile, the rest of the, um, the embryo is, is frozen until we get the sequencing results. And then once we've identified the, um, the embryos that are edited, they can be thawed and those embryos can be transferred into surrogate monkey mothers. And if we're lucky, we get a live infant. Last November, we were incredibly excited to um, have the, the, the birth of Gemma, as we call her. Uh, she's named uh, Gemma for gene-edited Myo7A, and she is our first fully edited um, Myo7A infant. So does she show the characteristics of Usher syndrome? Well, the first uh, thing to check was her hearing. And we worked with John Brigande, who is our great collaborator, who is an uh, auditory expert. And he confirmed at one and two months of age that she shows no auditory responses. So this was done by two methods. The first was the auditory brainstem response that measures the response of the auditory system at several stages of the nervous system. And the, the, the gray shaded area here shows the responses for normal one month old infants across, this is their thresholds, different, the amount of uh, intensity of sound at different frequencies across the, the whole spectrum of hearing. Um, Gemma showed no responses, um, even at high intensities, <clears throat> 90 decibels or above, to any frequency. The second method is called distortion product autoacoustic emissions. I know that's a bit of a mouthful, um, but it measures very specifically the response of the outer hair cells of the cochlea, which are the cells that are specifically affected um, in Usher 1b. And these blue lines show for different frequencies, again, across the spectrum of hearing, show the, uh, the responses at different intensities of a normal young infant, whereas Gemma showed no response um, at any intensity or frequency. So Gemma was confirmed to be, um, <coughs> confirmed to be deaf. Secondly, she shows signs of vestibular dysfunction with abnormal balance with uh, a, 
abnormal walk where her hind legs seem to be slow to catch up with her front legs and a wide stance gait, which we think helps her stay balanced. And she also spends a lot of her time hanging upside down, which is not normal. So the, the third part, of course, is retinal degeneration. In this case, we really did not know what to expect because of course in, in Usher infants, signs of retinal degeneration can take some time to emerge and it's quite variable. Um, so we um, did retinal imaging at one month and two months and did not see any abnormalities. But at four months, we already started to see some changes that indicated the beginnings of photoreceptor degeneration. This is a, um, an ocular coherence tomography scan of the retina. And this is an area peripheral to the optic nerve. The portion, the half on the left shows the normal layers of the retina with, with alternating dark and, um, and light layers. Whereas this area in the red rectangle shows a lot of disruption of the area of the photoreceptors and thinning of the nuclei of the photoreceptors. So this was our first sign that there was a beginning of retinal degeneration. Um, and very recently at six months, this kind of disruption has now spread to be more of a ring in the peripheral retina. Um, we've also found reduction in the electroretinogram, the standard measure of retinal function, where it was substantially reduced, both the A wave and the B wave of the electroretinogram were substantially reduced at four months of age. So Gemma is now the first gene edited non-human primate model of any retinal disease. She recapitulates the three primary features of human Usher 1B, loss of hearing, vestibular abnormalities, and now the beginnings of retinal degeneration. Our hope is that monkeys like her can provide a an optimal translational model for development of therapies for Usher syndrome. And in fact, uh, we are going to soon begin an AAV gene therapy in Gemma. In the future, we of course um, need more such animals. We're working very hard to produce um, more affected animals. And we hope that in the future, we can have enough to test multiple therapeutic approaches um, for this disease. And we also hope that with the experiment, the experience that we've gained, we can use gene editing to create um, valuable models of other inherited retinal diseases as well, including other forms of Usher syndrome. So um, I, I know the text here is really small to read, but I just want to get a, across the point that this work has taken a large collaborative team um, many people with many kinds of expertise um, that, and I have to thank all of them for their contributions to the work. And I want again to especially thank the Foundation Fighting Blindness and Safe Sight Now for supporting this work. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>